Good morning. Okay, good morning. We're having a storm here, and so I may get cut off from my Wi-Fi, but um, we're going to press on. <laughs> okay, so Jessica Lynn Hernandez is watching. Jessica Lynn Hernandez, welcome aboard. So the first question is from Greg Mandy. He asks, I am contemplating purchasing a leads list. Oh, Jesse Crane's in now. Uh, what is the best way to find a company that can provide me with a list that is right for my business? And so uh, James also mentioned Tom Black and help with scripts and sales methodologies. So um, let's talk a minute about lead lists, Greg. So I don't know what your business is. I don't know what you're selling. I don't know who you're selling to. And so it's very difficult for me to answer a question, where do I buy a lead list? But if you'll Google lead lists, you'll find them. Zoom information is an excellent source. It's expensive, but it's the best one that we found. And then there are lots of other lead lists you can purchase, some that you can even get free. So first of all, if you want me to answer this question, I want to know what the business is. And then secondly, I want to know who you're selling to, and I might give you a better answer. As far as scripts are concerned and uh, answers to objections, of course, that's what I do done that for hundreds of companies and be glad to help you with that too. And you can connect with me through uh, Shirley or Sean. Okay. So good luck. The next question is from Demarius too. Hey Demarius. He says, when should I hire my CPA as a bookkeeper? Well, first of all, let's talk about CPA and bookkeeper. They're two different things. Most CPAs don't do bookkeeping. They do lots of other advanced accounting functions, but bookkeeping isn't usually one of them. So you should get a bookkeeper, not a CPA, because they're less expensive until your company gets big enough to need advanced accounting functions. And I know you're talking to Rosalie, and so that's fine. She uh, has an accounting degree, has lots of bookkeeping experience, and she would be a good one for you to use. However, until you get to the point where either A, the bookkeeping is too much for you to do on your own, or B, you just can't make yourself do it, which is most of the uh, of the situations I see in small businesses. They just can't make themselves do it. They put it off. It's inaccurate when they do it, and then, and it's not their skill set. You should do it. And most of the time, a small business for $250, $300 a month can get a bookkeeper and know where they stand and know how their business is doing and it's more than worth the 250 or 300 a month to know where you're at. See, if you're not keeping score, there's no game. There's no business if you're not keeping score. It's just something you do every day when you get up. And so you gotta keep score yourself or you gotta keep score with a bookkeeper, okay? The next question is from Robin. Hey, Robin. She says, what ideas w you, would you have to build relationships with other local businesses in my area? Well, you know, we've talked about this for a long time, Robin, and it's not going to change. The answer is the same. You have to go to networking events like Chamber of Commerce, like uh, you got to go to art shows. Uh, you got to call on the galleries and meet them. You've got to go to businesses and meet them. You know, you, you have to just put yourself out there to network. And when you do that, good things will happen. But if you sit at home and paint and you don't ever go out and meet other people, the world will not build a path to your door. The biggest lie I've ever heard is if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. They won't. The only way they'll go to your door is if you let them know that you got a bit better mousetrap. Okay? So, Robin, you can do it. <laughs> but you got to make yourself leave your comfort zone and get out there and do something. Most personal growth comes from leaving our comfort zone. Most personal growth comes from when we say, I don't want to do that, and then we do it anyway. Or, I'm uncomfortable doing this, and we do it anyway. Or, we try to find an excuse not to do it or do it easier. Okay? Next, Josh C. R. Romiarto. <laughs> Sorry, Josh, I can't pronounce your last name. How do I know what questions to ask mentors when I don't know what questions to ask? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> but the mentors have areas of specialty. 
So my specialty is sales, but of course I have a broad experience in building businesses and so I might be able to answer other questions. But I think Sean has me in the group because he wants me to help answer questions about sales. So ask me questions about sales. How can I sell more would be a good question. How can I go about improving my product? How can I improve my pricing? How can I improve my delivery, my customer service? Those are all things which fall in the sales bucket, okay? And so Josh, you know, look and see what the mentors are good at, what their area of expertise is, and then ask them those questions. In addition, there's a whole library of material uh, in AO that people don't really take advantage of. And if you'll go back in and read those articles, listen to those videos, and you know, apply what you're hearing to your business, questions will occur, I promise. And when you watch these, put a piece of paper beside you with a pencil and write down the questions, okay? The next question is from Michael Wilding. Hey, Michael. After you buy into a business, how do you quantify that you have got your investment back? So this seems like a pretty basic question, Michael. The way you do it is, yeah, see how much you paid, and then you see how much you took out. And if what you take out is more than what you paid in, you got your investment back. You see, there's a lot more to knowing if you made a good investment than just that equation, but that's the simplest way to do it. Now, the next thing you do is you say, hey, I'm working in the business. I didn't really buy a business. I bought a job. And if I had a job somewhere else, I would be making X. So in the business, you have to make X plus in other order to get a return on your business investment. So if it's just X, you didn't get a return. If it's X plus, you did get a return. Okay. And that's, it's just that simple. And you know, a business bills and gives you an opportunity to increase your income. If it doesn't, it's not a good business. And so what happens the first six months, the first year is irrelevant to me in a business. What happens over the five years, the first five years that you have the business is what's important. And so will you get a return on your investment over the next four years, five years that you're in the business? That's the real question to be asking. Do you have a growth opportunity? That's the real question you should be asking. And is it something that I can continue to work in and build for the rest of my life? Those are the right questions, not whether I'm going to get a return on my investment. Okay. Next question is Kelly Killingsworth. Hi, Kelly. What steps should I need to take if I wanted to try and find and hire a commission-based salesperson since I don't have a budget to pay a salary, but I know there's a business out there? She owns an excavation company specializing in site prep, trenching, and road construction. I'm a one-man show. I need to drive sales. I need more work. Having someone else sell and pay them a commission is a new concept. Well, Kelly, I can tell you if you need more work, then you should spend your time as the chief sales officer of your company. If you're a one man show and you're not working 60 hours a week, then whatever hours you are working in your business, take the rest of the time and become a salesperson. Call on the people that need your services, let them know, go to networking events where you might meet people that will need those services, join building associations or other organizations of people that use your services and you become the chief sales officer. And looking for a salesperson on a straight commission when you're telling me you need more work is premature. When you're working 60 hours a week and you don't have any more time, then let's look for somebody who can help you with the sales. But until then, you're the chief sales officer, okay? Um, the next question, we don't have many questions this morning. The next question is from uh, Yum Yellow Cake, <laughs> Miss Wilson. Okay, how should I handle businesses who want to purchase my items at wholesale or discount prices? If I discount items and work with these companies, how much should I discount my prices? So let's say you have a wholesale and a retail strategy both. In other words, your wholesale strategy is you sell to people who um, resell your product. And so Lysander, your retail strategy is people you sell the product to at full price that you sell directly to the person that eats the cake. So 
one is direct and the other is basically wholesale or distributor sales. So you have to have a pricing model for the distributor and you have to have a pricing model for direct to consumer retail sales that you do yourself. And it's really that simple. I assume that you have a retail strategy already direct to consumer because you're selling cakes. But a wholesale strategy needs to allow the person who's selling the cake to make um, money from the sale of the cake. Think of that wholesale, think of that distributor who's going to sell your cake as your salespeople. And you are paying your salespeople a commission for selling your cakes. Okay? And the example that you give us here is uh, a caterer. So a caterer needs to make less on it probably than a storefront. But you talk to the caterer and say, this is what we sell them for retail. I'll sell them to you for this 20, 25% discount, and then you can resell them, okay? And the other one that you mentioned was um, a, uh, a store, um, and, and that, that person um, will probably need a higher markup because they have a lot more overhead and a lot more expenses. And you might even try to figure out a way to sell them uh, the cakes at a 50% discount, if you can, but you have to make a profit. That's the first rule. And then the business you're selling it to has to make a profit too. And then when both of y'all are win-win-winning, then you have a good relationship with a distributor or, you know, your salesperson. Okay? I hope I hope that helps. Um, Ricardo Delgado. His question is, how much how do you weigh the costs and returns with how many events and conferences you should attend within your industry to build relationships and get industry knowledge? So I think every mentor would appreciate this if you proofread what your question is before you send it in. I think every question this morning has typos in it and words that I can't figure out what they mean. And if you want us to help you, I think it would help if you proofread your questions and your business description to make sure that it makes sense and that we can understand what all of the words are because some of them are so badly misspelled that I can't figure out what they are. I'm a pretty smart guy. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to tell you that before I got into the questions. So back to um, Ricardo, okay? He owns and operates a barbershop business. I feel like it's necessary to always look to build relationships in my industry. I want to attend as many events as possible. And so, Ricardo, I can't tell you the answer, but this is the way we do it. We go to a, a conference or a meeting or a networking event, and then we come back and we see what advantages we got from it, what leads we got from it, what business connections we got from it. And if it wasn't profitable, we don't do it again. And that's the only way I know. There's a lot of experimentation in this when you first get started. The other thing is budget. Give yourself a budget in terms of your time and in terms of your money as to what you want to spend on these kinds of events. And then pick the ones you think will be the best that fit within your budget and your uh, for financial and your budget for your time. Because every time you go to one of these events, it's time you're trading for something else you could be doing to build your business. Okay? And that's the best advice I can give you. We go to a lot of trade shows and businesses I've built over the years, but we always had a budget and there were always more trade shows than we can afford to go to. So that's kind of the way to think of it. Okay? And then I think this is the last question from Randy Hanks. How can I make hiring an intern from a local college for marketing and social media successful. So I think that's a great idea. If you're a small business and you don't have a budget for a full-time marketing person, then sign up with the local colleges, network with your friends, post it on your Facebook, post it on your Instagram account, and let people know you're looking for an intern, somebody who would like to learn about your business, get paid, and at the same time help you in your business, which you and your business is uh, mark, what you want is somebody to help you with social media marketing, okay? And there'll be plenty of people that wanna go into that that are in college today 
and we'd like an opportunity to actually do it live and learn about it live. Lots of people for that, okay? And, um, you know, your question is, would you recommend the amount of hours a week to start? I'd say start them with what you can afford. You can afford 20 hours a week, get them 20. If you can afford 60 hours, I mean 40 hours a week, get them 40. It's just what can you afford is the answer to that question, okay? And then you asked me about hiring a full-time person. I don't think, I don't know the size of your business, but if you can afford a full-time business pers a person who's got four or five years of experience in this field, and have a track record of success, of course, that's who you want because they will add value to your business and they will add sales to your business. And that's what you are trying to do. Think about hiring people like an investment in your business. I'm going to hire Mary so that I can sell more. I'm going to help hire Bill so that I can sell more. I'm going to help hire John so that I can sell more. And if I can't sell more, I don't need to hire them. Okay. It's just, it really is that simple. Because when you hire somebody, obviously, you're going to increase your expenses in your business and you have to offset that increase in expenses with some kind of revenue, right? It's a formula, okay? Um, hope that helps. So that is all of the questions. I'm just going to look to make sure I answered everybody. I did. So... Uh, gang, the, you, you know, feel free to send these questions in whenever you have them. Also, feel free to reach out to Shirley or Sean if you want to uh, talk to me personally. Uh, I'll be glad to set up something to answer a quick question. And, of course, you know, if any of you all are needing sales or you're needing uh, scripts or you're needing a sales structure in your business, you know, that's what I do. And, and uh, my fees are really ridiculously low. So, anyway... Have a great week, and I look forward to talking to you next month. Bye.